If you're vulnerable to psychic damage from roguish language, stay away from these gibbering mouths. But if you intend on listening to this podcast about enriching your fantastical group hallucinations, you're too far gone already. Your next encounter is going to be perfectly planned, and here's why. In this episode, we're finding answers to what is the underlying planning framework for a reliably great encounter? And how can we analyze inspirations to find applicable ideas from film? And can we stick the landing on an epic, chaotic cluster of a final showdown in our current season? Welcome to the Hook and Chance podcast. I'm Big J, and this is my brother, T-Bone. Damn it. You're never allowed to introduce me again. <laughs> kind of thought we're back from a break. Come come in hot with some new names. <laughs> the worst names. <laughs> like, literally the worst. I really hope that does not stick. All right, I'm Jordan. And I'm his brother, Travis. Well, like any good GM, we want to show our players a great time. Something that is really memorable. You know, the, something that captures that real excitement of a great session. Yeah, if you're like us, you've probably GM'd more than your fair share of encounters that sucked ass. Everyone kind of (laughs) just walked away, started changing the subject as soon as they possibly could. You know, that vibe. And the problem is that you always go into those with the highest of hopes. Most of the other players typically just, you know, they'll get up from the table and they'll start moving around and... You're sitting there dying a slow, quiet death. (laughs) But we've also had those high moments where everyone is just buzzing with the energy that comes from a good session, which comes from great encounters. The problem with that is that there's no way to properly build encounters. There's no written book. There is no manual to it. Is it too much to ask for a replicable way to build encounters? Like, I just want something to follow so that I can look back at my encounters, understand what went wrong, and then start building on top of that to start improving my GM skills. But when it's just chaos, it's so hard to do. Yeah. All we want is something that's satisfying from a story perspective. I want some fun from a gameplay perspective. And something that's like really tense from a shit your pants perspective. That's what I want. Yeah, (laughs) that's the dream. But the problem that we've encountered is that it is such a messy art. There is no truly correct way to do it. And that's good. There's a million ways you can do it. The encounter building advice that we've seen floating around feels kind of like looking up a recipe only to get a listicle. You know, something that's just full of semi-relevant information. Yeah, like if I'm trying to make a burger, I find a listicle with entries like the history of beef, the (laughs) ratio of sugar and tomato in ketchup, down to its finest point, tips about what to look for when buying a gas barbecue and how to choose the finest pickles. (laughs) But I still don't really know what goes on a burger. That's a... A weirdly apt metaphor. (laughs) So the problem is, is that nowhere to be seen are thorough steps to follow. And none of that, you know, none of the barbecue, uh, burger, ketchup ideas are necessarily untrue. Like all of the advice you find in some of these GM listicles, you know, it's not deeply wrong. It made things so difficult for me learning to GM is really the problem that I had and the problem that we're trying to fix with this episode. And all we really want is a goddamn recipe to follow. (laughs) I want something. (laughs) I want all of the pieces of encounter building that could add to a solid foundation. Uh, Just a quick aside, Jord, what is your favorite bit of some of that misguided encounter advice? Well, the one that kept me looking for hours and days in the wrong direction is the whole start by choosing a monster or enemy or you know one step further is choose the perfect monster you get it in your head that somehow you're going to flip through that book of a 
thousand monsters and there's going to be one that just shines brightly right in your face and you're going to have this revelatory moment. But that does not happen. You just spend your whole planning session looking through that book. <laughs> right. And then that actually triggers the never ending cycle of like, oh, well, maybe if I used a different monster. Yeah, that would be the <laughs> exactly. thing that solves my encounter woes. Then there's the next step on top of that, which is choose the right monster for the environment. Tips like that are so just <laughs> kind of obvious, I guess. It's like, well, well, yeah, I mean, I'm going to choose an ice dragon if I'm working with the snow. That doesn't mean it's wrong to choose a red dragon if I'm in the snow. So really, it's like <laughs> it's just right. a sentence that doesn't do anything for it's, me. It's like uh, WikiHow instructions It's like. Don't stab your own hand with the knife. <laughs> yeah. Of course, I'm going to pair. I'm going to consider my environment when I'm building the damn encounter for my game. How dumb. Do you think I am? <laughs> so sounds wise is simple. And that's, you know, very much in line with some of the advice that we see out there. Uh, the other one that bothers me is the just add more enemies. If your encounters are boring, add more enemies. Okay. <laughs> but then I'll be the GM that has 30 individual monster turns yeah. while my players wait for 45 minutes for me to wrap up all my fucking rolls. <laughs> you want to give your entire party a chance to completely disengage while you figure shit out. <laughs> this is a great tip. I mean, you're going to give your players enough time to go home, take a nap, and then come back. Just text them when you're ready. And then there's the whole tip for whatever system you're running that basically boils down to like, get the balance just right. And in games like D&D, there's the CR, the challenge rating the monster. And it's one of those parts of the game for me that's if it's what you're into, go for it. But right. it is not a crucial step to creating a good encounter. Like spending two hours creating the perfect stat block from scratch just for this encounter, it, it's kind of cool, but like... <laughs> It's fine to not do that, too. It's fine to mix and match. It's fine to to get it a little bit wrong and adjust on the fly once you get a little more experienced with it. I mean, not even just building monsters from scratch. Like, there is a ton of GM advice out there that is leading you through the math on, you know, specifically D&D, &D, how to calculate CR and how to choose multiple enemies to mix and match and find that perfect ratio of challenge rating for your players at their particular level, you shouldn't need to spend your entire year figuring out all of the subtle calculus that goes into balancing an encounter Yeah, for fear of a TPK or something like that. And then you're left as a GM just kind of wondering, did I do something wrong or... Is the game not built well, or am I just too stupid to understand all of the goddamn... If you can't tell, I'm not a math person. Yeah, that's how we feel all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we dunk on it, because we are too stupid for the math. Make me do math, and I will get very angry. So, yeah, obviously, there's a lot of <laughs> pieces of advice that Travis and I have been steered wrongly by. So back to what we're trying to do here. We're trying to create a system, a complete system of encounter building. It's not a collection of random thoughts. It's step by step, the most thorough way that we know to capture everything you need to run an encounter, system agnostic, uh, situation agnostic. It's not just for combat. It can be for social encounters or environmental encounters. Whatever you want to do with it, do that. And the other note I'd like to make at the top is you know, we're not saying you should always use this. It's the only way. Do whatever you do. But if you ever feel like maybe you're missing a little piece of your encounter, something doesn't feel quite right, maybe just go through this and see if you're missing any of the kind of steps that we've laid out. What we really wanted to try to do was figure out a way that you could go through a list, find and fill those gaps, and then just simply assemble. Assemble your encounter. By going into that, uh, maybe this is an appropriate time to stop and say, this wasn't easy to do. We got a little paralyzed by the complexity. Every time we peeled back another layer and we said, well, is this necessary to building an encounter? Uh, that took a whole bunch of time to try and figure out and to talk back and forth uh, between the two of us to figure out what was it 
that made our encounters feel good now? What did we each do well? And then marry both of our uh, different ways of approaching this problem together into something that we knew would work on multiple levels for multiple people. But that took a long time. So this is our way of saying, we're really sorry. We took such a long hiatus, but we really hope it's worth it and that you give this method a try and see if it helps you fill in some of those gaps. See if your encounters just feel that much better. Because our philosophy with our episodes, if you haven't noticed, is to always try to put out something truly useful rather than just get another episode out this week. So <laughs> we have some gaps. Uh, we try not to make them too long, and we try to, to make sure that we value your time. So we really hope we hit that. We really hope we stuck the landing. We wanted something that wasn't prescriptive, that allowed our players to have fun, that kept ratcheting up the tension in the encounters. And this had to work for combat encounters, but also environmental ones, and even social encounters. Building better encounters seems to really just be the key that unlocks the fun in every single situation. So without further ado, let's actually explain how this all works. So there's two parts to our system. The first is identifying the elements that you're going to create the encounter with. Basically like laying out all your building blocks. And then the second part is assembling it into stages that, like Travis said, ratchet up that tension, and get everyone shit in their pants. Our very first element is identifying what the party goal is. What is it that the party cares about achieving? And this comes directly from the party, by the way. Too many times I've made up what I thought was the party goal, laid out an encounter, and they walked away because they never asked <laughs> to go there. <laughs> so, you know, this it's really important to be actually communicating with the players at your table and figuring out what the party wants to do. As you start to use the party goal to create your encounter, the trick here as a GM is to not dictate their method. So if they have identified that they want to get some blueprints, my usual reaction is to say, oh, okay, this sounds like a great stealth mission. You're going to stealth in and steal the blueprints. That's the new goal. But in doing so, I've dictated how they're going to achieve that goal. It should be simply get the blueprints. When you've spent all evening preparing a stealth encounter and I just bash the door in <laughs> with a barbarian, you get pissed off. <laughs> right. And it's not fun for anyone. <laughs> this is a great example of ways that GMs screw themselves over. Yeah. And there could be multiple goals, by the way. And some of those tips that we went over earlier that we don't like are all kind of focused on adding complexity. Like the tip, add more monsters. Well, this is actually what we do to accomplish that. We add more goals. Again, what the party cares about, part of good game design and good GMing in general is kind of setting up elements that the party gets invested in so that you can create encounters around them later and kind of threaten those things that the party cares about and have them go after goals they actually want to go after. You can get the party invested in their base, NPCs, pets, vehicles, reputations, relationships with important people like kings and dukes. You know, there's a thousand things, but the more of these that you have in those encounters, the more everyone's going to care about it. Right. And if the party has made friends along the way, any friends, we'll have them as the victims of an abduction so we can add the rescue the NPCs as the goal. Now, all of a sudden, in example encounter they're not only getting the blueprints but they're gonna have to rescue an npc who just happens to be there uh-oh yeah they just fell over in their chair and screamed out and you recognize their voice <laughs> okay it doesn't sound like they're in a lot of danger but what we're there's an on. anvil hanging over their head travis <laughs> it's very dangerous uh, got it got it so the anvil's on fire <laughs> just, just shut up <laughs> Then we ensure the encounter has gravity by showcasing what is at stake if they do not accomplish their goal. Unfortunately, your anvil on fire <laughs> actually is a great example of this. Yes, I know. Don't say things unless they're great, Travis. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not going to touch that one. So in our example, what happens if they don't get the blueprints? Well, someone is going to construct that mega death ray machine. 
and take their revenge. And if that NPC doesn't get rescued, well, they have a flaming anvil hanging above <laughs> them, I guess. Yes, yes, that is very threatening. Then we got to figure out who stands in the party's way and why. This is their antagonist. Now, we haven't necessarily gone into this. You could start planning an encounter with an antagonist in mind, but we often determine their goal before their identity as it's kind of crucial. We need to make sure that their goal conflicts with the party's goal. And giving that antagonist an actual goal is kind of the important part for us. It's what allows the party to be creative in their overcoming this problem. It's so much more than just, here's a person or a monster. It's in your way. And keep in mind that we're not necessarily giving our antagonist the goal of killing the party. The antagonist has their own goals, and that is what allows them to come up with alternate solutions. If their goal is to kill the party, there's very few ways that that's going to end other than either the party dying or the antagonist dying. Whereas if the antagonist just has something else, then the party could potentially turn that around and, and do something creative with it. In our example, maybe the antagonist is trying to achieve something with those blueprints. Maybe the party figures out a way to swap the blueprints around for something else less dangerous. Oh, so you're saying that the blueprints are for the mega death ray machine that I mentioned, but the party could swap it out for a Build-A-Bear workshop machine. <laughs> Definitely. It's some kind of weird Rube Goldberg, <laughs> and he won't realize until the entire thing is <laughs> assembled, and then he'll go... This just spits out bubbles and bear stuffing. <laughs> Boiled ya. Yeah, he'll get completely done before he realizes <laughs> that he's been duped. Then finally, we need to decide on the environment. And once you've figured out the kind of general location that this encounter is going to take place, you can have a loose brainstorm of all the possible elements that could be there for the party to interact with and that are going to flesh out the scene. There's really no wrong answers at this point. You're just literally brain dumping, and then you're going to pull from this list that you've made in the next step when we assemble everything. Now, for example, uh, this could all take place in a well-guarded warehouse lair. You know, we've got a rooftop peaky window that you can creep inside so as to imply stealth, but not dictate it. We need stuff for other characters to play with. We need a crane for hijinks and high jumps. We need a pile of wooden posts for rolling on your foes. We need a storm to be a Bruin so that, you know, everything's under the cover of darkness and vents to crawl through. We need areas with low lighting and areas with high lighting for our rogue. We need uh, all kinds of different things for the party to interact with or potentially for the antagonist to interact with. When I start running dry creatively on this step, I usually just try to think of things that can let individual PCs shine or give advantage or disadvantage to one side or the other. I kind of think of potential paths that this encounter could take, knowing full well that it won't take those, but the players will do something creative with the elements that I've put in. Now we're going to assemble, and what we're going to do with this is we're going to take that party goal, we're going to take the antagonist, the environment, all of the levers that we've made this big list, this big brain dump in each one of those categories, and now we're going to assemble it. And we're going to assemble it by thinking about three separate categories. Tactic changes, environment changes, and stake changes. Each one of these evolves and shifts through the three stages to an encounter, increasing in intensity, keeping everything interesting because it is shifting. Yeah. Three stages for us is, is always enough to be as complex as we ever need without going overboard and dragging things along. Right. This specifically is what corrects for that uh, encounter drag that so many of us often experience when we set up some really wicked encounter. We're so excited because we've got this big end boss or something like that. And then we go, God, this has been dragging on for an hour and a half. <laughs> Why is this going so long? If we have three separate stages, then we shift when we feel the tension or the energy in the room drag. And it has another kind of ebb and flow effect 
So like the first stage is the establishing stage. You kind of introduce all three of those elements, the tactics, environment, and stakes to the party. You introduce all the details that they need to know. They adapt to whatever threat you've put in front of them, whatever challenge, and they figure out how they're going to handle it. That's usually when that tension starts to dwindle. So then you introduce stage two, where the antagonist gets serious. Uh, the players have found a bit of success in that stage one, their plans on, on track, and then things shift on them. You as the GM put the pressure on and make them adapt. Then they start getting used to stage two. So you step it up to stage three, where the antagonist is starting to get desperate and they do a table flip. Players were finding their footing again in stage two and the antagonist was maybe almost looking beat and they pull out their last ditch effort to ruin the party at this point. What I love so much about this, this is a standard of storytelling. This is a standard in every action movie that you've ever come across. Yeah, I can't argue with that. All the video games we've been playing and movies we've been watching as we uh, <laughs> process our latest Josh. thoughts. <laughs> No, we've been working hard at this the entire time. <laughs> in this episode, we're going to go through those steps with you as we grab inspiration from our session zero, and we're going to use these steps to flesh out our big, bad, holy hell of a capstone encounter for the adventure that we've been building throughout this season. Corruption in the Temple of Trials. But fear not, if you've not been listening to this entire season one by one, you're still going to get some serious value from this episode because all you need to know is that we've got our team of heroes who are escorting a child monk through some dangerous dungeon to a temple at its heart where they will try to stop the corruption of the healing waters that provide for the surrounding town. And they will journey to the location of the ritual only to discover the child's longtime mentor, the grand monk of their order, is behind this corruption. What a twist. <laughs> but before we do that, let's grab some inspiration by heading to the extra dimensional gateway. This is the extra dimensional gateway where strange yet familiar alternate realities can be summoned forth when help is needed. So with this, we want to steal some ideas from the inspiration sources that were covered in the session zero that we had at the beginning of this season. We had some of our patrons come in and we brainstormed the movies that we were going to use for inspiration, the specific scenes. And so that's what we're doing here. We're taking what we love from those scenes and we're going to use it in creating this final encounter. So the first one, that we really wanted to tackle. Is there a better, grander action set piece than the Battle of Helm's Deep? No. <laughs> and Travis will fight you if you say yes. I'll just watch. So we're specifically talking about that scene where Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli are all standing on the wall. They're facing this wall, this massive army of orcs who are marching on Helm's Deep it's in the rain. It's so cinematic. It's super cool. So I don't know. What do we have to steal from that particular encounter? Well, it kind of supports our whole theory because it could have been just a pretty straightforward castle assault. But what made it so epic was that the enemy tactics kept shifting in a way that demanded a response from the party. You've got the ladders going up. Then it shifts to the bombers at the gate that are trying to get in. Again, Legolas gets a chance to shine. Uh, then you've got the choke point on the ramp where Gimli has to be tossed into battle and he gets his moment of heroics. Yeah, where he, he holds off that, yeah, that bottleneck. That was so cool. Yeah. So we need some choke points. We need, uh, well, we need those three stages. I mean, if you want an excuse to go and watch Helm's Deep on YouTube <laughs> right now, like go check it out because I bet you you will see those perfect three stages as soon as things start normalizing they shift another reason i really like this is you know what thinking about it from a tabletop game perspective you've got gimli who had nothing to do as an archer on that wall so if we would have kept it standard just one stage of encounter right. as the gm i would have been shitting my pants i feel panic. i feel like 
Peter Jackson almost knew this because remember <laughs> when Gimli's on the wall, he's barely able to even look yeah, over it. It's like, a joke that he can't engage. Right. They're <laughs> just waiting for something to shift. Yeah. Another thing that I really like about this is that because we have multiple stages and we've planned for things to change and shift, Legolas, if you recall, Legolas screws up. Like, he is unable yeah. to defeat the bomber before the bomber blows a huge hole in the wall. But that doesn't mean the encounter is over. It allows for moments of failure and moments of success throughout the larger battle. Right. Yeah, they can win the war but lose the battle. This scene also establishes the stakes and goal super well, right. very simply. The women and children are what are at stake here. It shows these people as heroes because their goal is to protect those women and children at any cost. Their goal isn't to survive the onslaught or beat the orcs, it's protect the innocents. Right, so, you know, heroes can fall, all kinds of things can happen, but as long as those women and children are safe, and again, Peter Jackson knows what he's doing this whole time, because when they set up Helm's Deep, the whole thing, there's like five full minutes of tension building, <laughs> where it's like, orcs, women and children, yeah. orcs, soldiers orcs women and children again <laughs> and like why did we go back and forth so many times to those women and children cowering inside helm's deep because they were the stakes they're what's at risk and while we don't recommend you know taking five minutes we do absolutely recommend at the start of encounters like if you need to do a cutaway scene to show the stakes do it you want the players to understand what's at risk with this encounter every single time Right. Okay. I think we we hit that one pretty well. The second bit of inspiration that I know that we wanted to try to tackle, let's do a little bit of an analysis. We originally said with the child monk that we are going to have this child monk have some powers and we're going to draw inspiration from Stranger Things because that was a great example of where you got kids in way over their heads. <laughs> and it's also got a bit of that kind of like 80s nostalgia that's kind of going on that we're trying to infuse into this like classic dungeon adventure. Yeah. And the scene in particular we're thinking of is in season four. So spoilers. I mean, that's a very much newer show than Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Didn't feel bad about that one. Yeah. But Eleven is nearly out of the facility at this point and Dr. Brenner catches up to her. Keep her in his clutches. I'm not certain that that is a spoiler, in fact, because like. I feel like that happened like three or four times throughout the series. Like I, I couldn't pinpoint at an exact moment, but you've always got this relationship where Dr. Brenner is this like fatherly good figure who's also incredibly manipulative yeah. and clearly up to no good. And that's kind of what we want to infuse in our Grandmaster Monk here. Yeah, very intelligent, obviously, but... Definitely ulterior motives, selfish desires that he paints a very pretty picture over top of. What's really cool about these kinds of scenes is, again, another challenge. Go ahead, look up some of these scenes on YouTube, and you will see those same three stages play out. So in this particular one, you know, you've got Eleven, who is trying to get out of Dr. Brenner's clutches, and Dr. Brenner does the whole thing where... Like, he starts off really nice and like, I'm taking care of you. Don't you understand? And then he shifts to like a guilting kind of vibe. And then he shifts to an angry kind of vibe when things are not going his way. And so the same three stages of our encounter planner play out even in this kind of social encounter. Yeah, it's a really good example of that kind of social combat, if that's what you want to go for. Then we have another Lord of the Rings reference because they're just so dang good. But we have the Bridge of Khazad-dûm, where the Fellowship is kicking ass and running through the mountains. Orcs and Balrog are hot on their tail. They're kicking them off bridges. They're narrowly avoiding disaster at every turn. <laughs> I I was having trouble picturing where this was happening because you said running through the mountains, but you mean literally running through <laughs> the mountains. Yeah. <laughs> like, through the mines of Moria. Straight on through. Yes, okay, all right. <laughs> so, yeah, I was like, the Balrog wasn't in, like, snowy waste. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, got it, okay, cool.
cool. But we want to take that absolute shit show, dungeon danger kind of vibe. Everything's collapsing. Everything's frenetic. There's one chance and it's get out. When that Balrog shows up, it is kind of a holy shit moment. Yeah. But I feel like it lands better because we built up to it. Like if the Balrog just showed up, that's fine. But it was because they already kicked a troll's ass and then they're just booking it. Yeah. And they're being chased <laughs> by a horde of enemies. And the only only thing that's worse than that horde of enemies is the goddamn Balrog when he shows up. Yeah. So I think one of the really important points that we're going to have to hit when we build our final encounter is exactly that. Like, we can't introduce a monster too soon. We got to build up to it. True. And for those first two stages of this scene, you've got the threat of the Balrog kind of existing in the background. But then they all start scrambling and screaming. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a question about this scene. Very much unrelated to our point. Who would win? Who Who's faster? Gandalf or those hobbits? Yeah, I Who's feel keeping pace. <laughs> Gandalf, old man. Hobbits, <laughs> tiny legs. Yeah. Does he have wizard power <laughs> on his feet? Yeah, he cast uh, like expeditious retreat. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. Aragorn's definitely just trying to usher the whole group, though. Legolas hasn't even broken a sweat. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's at a light jog. <laughs> And you know, Gimli, like there was a lot of swear words under his breath. Oh, yeah. He's always going max. (laughs) (laughs) Heft and all that armor around. (laughs) Now that we have that settled. You know, one of the last points that I want to make about this is just that this gives that great sense of overwhelm. This is the sense of overwhelm that we're really after when we're playing D&D or any other tabletop RPG where we want some really big encounter to feel big and meaningful. And this is what it takes. When those players survive, they never once question if it was the GM saving their ass. (laughs) In this event, you know, you've got Gandalf there. And Gandalf, whether he was a part of the party or maybe an NPC, but there was some serious sacrifice that happened in that moment. Yeah. And so, yeah, the the players never get a sense of deus ex machina where something just popped out of nowhere and saved their butts. And the environmental threat was on both sides. Like, yes, vast chasm. The party could have fallen in it. The Balrog fell in it. Right. You know, you can use that environment to anyone's advantage. Yeah. And we haven't built it specifically to cause problems for the players or for the enemies. You know, it's just there. It just exists. That's probably enough about all of these bits of inspiration. I think we got what we need. Yep. Let's move on to the Proven Grounds and build our encounter. Watch and cheer at the Proving Grounds, where heroes collide with challenges and rivals that will test their metal. So we're going to need to come up with our party goal stakes. We're going to need to identify the antagonist and their goal, flesh out the environment, and then put it all together. So with our party, we set up this whole adventure. They've been invested. They started it by getting themselves invested in the town, a town that was on the brink of extinction because people didn't have even long enough to make it to the next town. You know, they're... they're hacking up blood they're not doing good an entire town is going to die unless they fix the healing waters so i as a gm can assume that that's probably up near the top of their list that being said if they haven't got invested in that goal and somehow made it here we're not going to make it our our primary uh party goal but we've laid as much groundwork as we can to get them invested in that we've also in this adventure built them an NPC to get thoroughly invested in. Hopefully, if they're not heartless monsters, (laughs) which many, many parties tend to be somehow, uh, they're probably going to be invested in this kid. So protect the child is going to be another party goal. And with pieces of the adventure that we've built, it's more than just like their physical well-being that we're hoping that the party is invested in. 
they if they are just invested in that great but they might also you know be invested in the relationship that they have with the child versus the relationship that that child has with their actual mentor like maybe the party's becoming mentors you've got this kid's future hangs in the balance they're kind of the last member of their order right so if everything goes to shit here then they're not gonna have any direction for their lives so there's kind of a lot to do with this kit if we've run the adventure i mean we've set it up so even in this encounter it's not gonna be an easy decision because like you said jared if they take out this mentor you know there's very few other monks this kid is going to be alone in running this temple or maybe the the temple doesn't even exist anymore because yeah. this battle got so out of hand so with these multiple goals we're going to kind of focus the most on on whatever the party cares about when we get there we're going to have the flexibility here to shift priority right so then we need to choose which stakes we are going to focus on and make a big fat list of all of the stakes that we have to hang over our party the most important piece here is showcasing what is at stake at the beginning of the encounter, making sure that the party is 100% informed before they go doing something stupid. God, I cannot tell you the number of times <laughs> I've gotten halfway into an encounter sit, sitting there questioning, like, why the hell hasn't anybody used the very a rickety chandelier that's clearly <laughs> hanging? Oh, shit, I didn't tell them about yeah, that. All right, that. <laughs> God damn it. Or what's happened to me before because I've got this whole fiction built out in my head, but I don't do a thorough job, you know, introducing this and showcasing these stakes. And then halfway through the encounter, one of the players says, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> you're you're toe to toe with the big bad boss. And you're asking now what you're doing. If there is anything that makes you as a GM want to just get up from the table <laughs> and leave, yeah. it's that moment right there. But the blame is on me. The GM is my point. If I if I introduce things properly, that won't happen as often. Right. So we need to showcase what's at stake for each one of those goals. It, we could even just quickly cut to the town. Yeah. Um, and say, you know what? People are gasping at the, uh, you know, the steps to the temple. You might even be able to hear them from within the temple outside. Kind of, you know, maybe there's a riot going on. Maybe they're just moaning and wailing. If I don't want to do that. And I've established that, like, they're far away from the town. There's no way that I I don't really want to do a cut outside. I just want to, you know, explain the situation in this room. All I have to do is have, like, a little, uh, like an ornate waterfall that usually is gouting this beautiful blue healing water. But instead, it's green and it's kind of bubbling and yeah. maybe fizzing the whole time. Like, remind them by showing some of those healing waters pouring into the room. Everyone knows. Blue is healthy, green is sickly. Absolutely. <laughs> Red is Bernie. Yeah. So then how do we make sure that the party knows that the child is in danger? Well, we do want to highlight this child's, you know, physical um, lack of defenses. So <laughs> as this temple is kind of crumbling, we, we could easily just have a little piece of debris hit the kid, knock him over, like scrape him. Like, oh, if that was all it took to throw them off balance, then we're going to have to work to protect this kid. Right. Uh, even if it just, like, a piece falls and breaks in front of one of them, they're hopefully going to go, yeah. oh, shit. <laughs> True. We're going to have to show that the child still cares for that grand monk mentor figure and vice versa. So, you know, Ooh. the child actually saying out loud, like, please don't hurt them. Right. Let's talk to him we need to make sure that the party understands before this kicks off that the kid still very much cares for their mentor yeah if there's any hope of resolving this peaceably it has to be conveyed somehow and then when they enter the mentor having the same kind of reaction to the kid oh there you are even worse the mentor could get really pissed at the party like <laughs> you brought them here <laughs> The last of the order. And then, you know, when the kid doesn't immediately reach to help the mentor, like, then the mentor could get really pissed off at the party, too, and just, you know, be angry that they've maybe maybe poisoned the child's mind against them. Yeah. And really aim all of that ire towards the party. 
And what I really like about this setup is that we're kind of planning on having that conversation be the first stage of this encounter. But what this allows us to do is have the child's loyalty be in question until any fighting actually breaks out, if Ooh. it does. Because if the party goes off half cocked and blasts the bad guy, <laughs> very, very likely, <laughs> then the child might just shift sides and say, like, you just you just went chaotic. I like I still care about my mentor. I'm I'm fighting on his side now. This is going to be a brutal choice. <laughs> yeah. Mid combat. <laughs> I love that. This is where we get into that whole Eleven and Dr. Brenner conversation. Yeah. But I think I think going back to the whole like, hey, you poisoned my mentee against me. You know, I'm doing this for the good of all of us. Like that will allow us as a GM to kind of have the mentor maybe disqualify anything that the child has to say so that we don't get into that whole thing where the GM is having a conversation with themselves. Right. Very important. There. Like, hush, child, I'm <laughs> dealing with these assholes. If nothing else, then uh, a spider jumps in the kid's mouth and bites. Stung. <laughs> that is so good. Can you imagine? <laughs> The I'll do questions anything. your players would have. <laughs> I will go to any length to make sure I don't have to have a conversation with myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Um, yeah, okay. So, you know, we also maybe should show the child's concern for the temple, maybe the mentor's concern for the temple as well. Yeah. Uh, the kid could just say, like, oh, no, my home. You know, something as simple as that. Yeah, there's that. There's the fact that maybe, you know, it'll be a lot harder to kind of maintain these healing waters without the temple. Right. So that's some pretty good stakes. Yeah. So then we need to identify our antagonist. Obviously, we've got the Grand Monk. Yeah. The Grand Monk, their goal is not to necessarily murder the party, though it's probably creeping up there because, you know, from the Grand Master's perspective... They've brought this child into a dangerous place. They've exposed them for the duplicitous bastard that they are. But he's probably more likely to try to convince them to his side, though, to his true, goal. True, because he's doing this to harness the power so that he can dole it out as he sees fit. So this is a morality play. This is a I am wise. All of this town has been taking advantage of these healing waters for ages, I'm going to determine who is is worthy. Worthy, yeah. right. So, really, it has nothing to do with killing the party. The mm -hmm. Grand Monk could easily sway the party. You know, offer them gold, offer them uh, healing yeah. for the rest of their <laughs> lives. Exactly. I will heal you. I will remove any ailments. What party is just like, wait, what? <laughs> okay. Forever heals? Yeah. So, there is lots of ways that this could resolve itself that doesn't equal death. And then the Grand Monk's secondary goal is to keep or redeem his relationship with his protege, that monk child. Ooh. Because yes. he knows that that's the future of his ambitions as well. Like, he needs the kid, otherwise everything dies with him. Man, that goal right there adds so much more weight to that the state of that relationship. Yeah. And as soon as that is taken away, as soon as the monk loses out on that goal, they're going to get a lot more chaotic. <laughs> exactly. Like, the shit is going to hit the fan. <laughs> what is the point? Like, all you've got is the power, but the kid, your order is dead. Mm -hmm. Like, that's it. It's over. I'm killing you now. I'm getting cranky is my uh, go-to villain line. <laughs> I'm getting cranky. You open all of your combats with that line? <laughs> yeah. God, that must get tiresome after a while. <laughs> yeah. Desperate requests to change it. <laughs> Can you please? Stay strong. Oh, here comes the line. Dedication to the craft. Yeah. Our other antagonist for this uh, encounter is going to be the monster. So in the adventure, we've got this kind of growing monster threat as they go through the dungeon. And this is where that's going to kind of culminate as well. So massive monster. With monsters, their goal can still be pretty simple to feed is this one's. And while it's still pretty straightforward, it's it's better than just planning for the party to fight the monster because the party can still solve that goal for the monster differently if they get creative. 
I see a grandmaster in the room that is a fine, tasty snack. Yup, nice and plump. So, yeah, in with this goal, it means that who knows which way this monster is going to fuel its goal. Yeah. We can determine it with a dice roll. I mean, this is when the players always pull out some crazy-ass spell. Right. And then the final antagonist, if you can call it that, is going to be the temple crumbling itself. So we have an environmental antagonist, and its goal is really just to fall apart if it takes enough damage. <laughs> All right, well, let's get into the environment itself. Figure out what we can pepper in to make this epic and grand. Well, we need something for our ranged folks. We need something for our, uh, you know, our melee folks to pitch themselves off of. So we definitely have to have two levels to kind of like a I'm seeing like a central atrium. Yeah. With a second level that circles the whole thing. Kind yeah. Of like a balcony. Yeah. Like a balcony. So that way they will also have some cover. That balcony can fall down. Like there's a lot that can happen there. Yeah. We need the choke point for uh, from the battle for, for Helm's Deep. I'm kind of picturing like one end of this huge atrium, you know, has kind of like a grand alcove, like a place where rituals take place. Oh, OK. So it's like all ornate and shit. But there's maybe like a a ramp or something leading up to that alcove. So it's it's raised off the ground. And now we have a ramp that starts kind of central in the middle of this big atrium. And then it goes up towards that alcove, meaning that our players only have one direction and they have kind of the high ground. So it's going to be tough to get them out of there. Right. Kind of like tucked away in the corner. This gives all of our melee characters a wonderful opportunity to, you know, pitch themselves, you know, charge the uh, yeah. charge the ramp like that's super <laughs> cool. Thank that shit. Well, in that alcove is going to be this ritual that he's working on. We probably need to give it a kind of destructive uh, element to it so that it's got waves of energy that are going to be crumbling the already crumbling ruins of this <laughs> temple and causing that chaos that we need. Hell I'm, yes. I'm thinking maybe it's even a piece of the environment that can be manipulated if players were to get to it or aimed. Ooh. Like, it can be focused, maybe, is the word I'm looking for. Right. I mean, if you've got big central pillars in the room, then you could have a character push it over or blast it towards the the Grandmaster or maybe just use some of it as cover as it starts falling down. We can throw the Healing Waters into this encounter if we want to. The Healing Waters are supposed to be directly influenced by this room, so it makes sense to maybe have channels of it flowing through. They could be pretty deep. Players always do something weird when water is in the encounter. Well, and especially poisonous, dangerous water yeah. <laughs> that like hurts you if you stand in it. That adds all kinds of difficult terrain for our party to like work around. But I, I think we can even go harder. And, you know, like we kind of mentioned, as the temple crumbles, you know, we've got pieces that they have to run up on. We've got pieces up to the second level. We've got pillars falling over, creating cover, all of that stuff. But then it also allows the monsters to access this room as it's falling apart. Yeah. And you can be creating cool moments on the fly. Like if somebody wants to charge up, then you have a piece drop. Yeah. And they're able to do that. Hell yeah. So all of those things that we've discussed that we have to get out up front, the layout of the room. All of the, the pillars and the kids and the conversations, you poison my protege against me, all of that stuff, we make a list of those things that we need to provide up front before the combat even starts. Then we get to stage one. So the first stage we're thinking is going to be that tense social encounter. The Grand Monk, his tactics here are going to be to try to talk the party out of their course, win them to his side, convince them that his way and this ritual is the best way to actually help the town and do all the good right things. Again, we've got that child's allegiance hanging in the balance based on what the party does and how they respond to the Grand Monk. If they turn on him too quickly, the child might turn sides. If they get the Grand Monk angry enough, then the child might see that he's not someone to be trusted. Right. And then I think depending on how this plays out, we can focus the Grand Monk's attention in different places. Like if the party really pisses him off, maybe he'll turn attention to getting rid of them. 
But if he hasn't been pissed off too much, then he'll just focus on trying to complete his ritual because that's his priority. Yeah. But once we shift out of that social stage by either the party's actions or the mentor's actions, we're going to move into stage two, where that grand monk is going to fully focus his efforts on the party. Because he's not focused entirely on his ritual, but the ritual can't be stopped at this point, you know, this ritual starts pumping out huge waves of energy and it starts hitting the temple and things are starting to collapse. That's escalating that tension. The environment change is going to be some of that, the the falling debris that's going to cause movement to be dangerous. Yep. Give some cover. We're going to have small monsters start to come up through the cracks in the floor more in that environmental hazard way than in a new enemy kind of a way. Yeah, so we're going to have to like think swarm tactics. Yeah. To up the stakes here of that child, we can have them nearly fall into one of the crevices that's opening up on the floor, you know, into the <laughs> swarms of monsters below. Well, I mean, right now we've got a grand monk who doesn't have the same kind of action economy that four players have. Yeah. So... Having one player use their entire turn trying to save a kid that's, you know, dangling over the edge, that's that's where we want to start throwing this kind of stuff in. And then when the energy starts to lag or the party's really starting to hammer on that Grand Monk, we enter stage three, where the monster, the main monster has been disturbed enough to enter the picture. Or the hole is wide enough for it to yeah. get in. <laughs> Break like, through. We could start to introduce it early, like the Balrog. You know, we indicate that this is in fact a danger. So maybe some of the cracks in the floor, you can hear like the gurgling before yeah. it even gets there. And now it's big enough to burst through the floor, sending shit flying everywhere. Maybe kind of like a thumping in that stage too from Ooh, below. <laughs> yes. I love that. So at this stage, the Grand Monk accepts that he's probably not going to complete his ritual. Maybe he absorbs whatever power that he can from it, where it's at right now. This gives him maybe a little bit of rejuvenation, Ooh. gives him some extra powers. Maybe it even deforms him a bit because he's just, you know, oh, I taking love on that. too much. Yeah, when it, this is this is the glow stage <laughs> when like veins start to yeah. throb blue and shit. The temple is definitely coming down. Yes. It's going to be in complete ruins. Maybe you've even got like some vantage points where town folk are watching. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. But seriously, like they've gotten over the temple uh, outer walls and now they're they're so desperate because they're so on the edge of death that they'll they'll start drinking from the uh, the still kind of semi poisonous water. Yeah. Like you said, they're just staring in awe, hoping to see that if this goes the party's way, that they can run in and maybe get healed at the last moment. Yeah. Of course, you've got that monster whose tactics are entering the picture. It's just going buck wild. That's going to be a fun time. Yeah. So, God, this this is feeling much better to me than I think what we originally had, which was just a, you know, a fight between the monk <laughs> and the party in a temple energy beams sky beams obviously <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i don't know this feels way more dynamic and way more interesting and way more chaotic than anything we were about to make and i just feel like i'll be able to kind of adapt a lot better with this encounter right and we've got so many different goals and so many different stakes that the party can fail at some of them and still succeed at their end goal yeah, it's going to be a mixed success for sure, almost no matter how you slice it. Whatever our players want to focus on, whatever outcomes they want to create is okay. We've got a lot to work with, and as GMs, I think we'll be ready to take on whatever happens. So with all of this, there's a Notion template that we've been working on as well that has all of this and more. It's got instructions with it too to remind you of what each piece might mean. You can clone it. Put your own encounters on it. You can add a map or two. It should have everything you need to make epic encounters. Let us know how that goes. Let us know what you come up with, if it helps, if certain parts are confusing or don't help. Speaking of things that help, let's talk about our patrons real quick who yes. stuck with us <laughs> while we were not producing episodes. But luckily, we have a Patreon structure that 
really is a by the episode kind of structure. So patrons never have to pay when we're not doing shit, when we're <laughs> sitting on our asses. Yes, my guilt and shame would be tripled if that were the case. Well, and it really allows us to focus on trying to build stuff that we want to build, that we know has value, and we never get into that place where we feel obligated to put something out that's half-baked that yeah. we don't really believe in just to keep the next episode going. So we really appreciate all of the love and support and sticking with us, you wonderful, wonderful patrons like Inigo the Brave. Adam F. Alex R. Steve A. Sigma. Kaleidoscope. Skylar E. Do Art. Blackthorn. First Law. Peacock Dreams. DM Thunderbum. Marley R. I'm Warp. Dangerous Marmalade. No Ma'am. Michelle T. Adlerius. Chris F. The Senate. Lucas D. Lila G. The GM Tim. DM Natsky. Heavy Arms. Leprechaun. And Will HP. Thanks to Tabletop Audio for the sound effects that you heard in this episode. Check out the resources that we have on our website for free, hookandchance.com. You can also check the show notes for that resource as well, but uh, it's on both. And if this helped you, or you think it could help another GM somewhere out there who's struggling with the same challenges that we were before we created this, please share this episode or consider leaving a review or share it on Reddit, whatever the hell you want to do. Uh, just get it out there and get it into folks' hands that could potentially use it. If you have some estranged family members that you want to get off your back, <laughs> have no idea what we're talking send about. Send them a random resource. <laughs> send them an episode. Share the share the show. Right. Okay. That's definitely the people we want listening. You can join an awesome community of players and GMs on our Discord. Please come be a part of the conversation. You can become a patron to help guide the show and uh, tell us what we should cover, what you need. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening, listening and extinguish those games. anvils. They're a threat. Dangling for carrots.